so Islam can be at home in these islands. And I think Abdullah Quilliam is, is our great trailblazer. His legacy is truly great. The sign of, of who he was is the fact that there's a rebirth that's taken place. He had courage to preach Islam when the whole, when it was a strange alien religion to his whole community, he took that stand and he started to call people to Islam. Bismillah, he started and he didn't look back. You're listening to Sunnah's Dream, a podcast exploring the prophetic way. Bismillahi wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillahi wa ba'd. Dear brothers and sisters, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. You know, generally when we, we gather for these podcasts, um, I do tend to say it's a very special uh, podcast, but uh, I mean that sincerely from the, the depths of my heart. Um, and Allah knows that we're going to talk about um, the one and only uh, Sheikh of Islam in the British Isles, um, the late uh, Sheikh Abdullah Kuliam, may Allah shower his mercy upon him. Um, not only is it that we're going to speak about uh, the Sheikh, um, but also we are actually, for those who are watching this as opposed to just listening, uh, we are currently in the Sheikh Abdullah Quilliam Masjid uh, in Liverpool um, and actually seated um, at the platform where the Sheikh uh, over uh, many decades, um, certainly years in his time in li- with the Liverpool Muslim community, um, spoke about Islam to encourage his fellow Victorian uh, Englishmen to, to the deen, uh, uh, to an indigenous white English population here in, in Liverpool. Um, and you know, I just feel uh, that much more honoured that we're with the, uh, our resident scholar and co-host, Sheikh Haroon. Asalaamu Alaikum. Wa Alaikum Asalaam. Who I don't think we've mentioned in the past, but now it needs to be mentioned, is actually the khatib of this very masjid. Alhamdulillah. And we have also with us a, a very respected and well-known uh, Muslim historian, or historian in general, uh, who is a... Uh, um, a specialist in the life and times of uh, Sheikh Abdullah Quilliam, <coughs> and that's Sidi Yahya Bert Ustad. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So, Sheikh Haroon, I think it was the last time we were filming podcasts in Liverpool, and I think we, I think before we started filming, there was a conversation about, mm-hmm. oh, wouldn't it be nice actually now that we're in Liverpool, which is arguably, and I think we'll we'll actually get to the conclusion, is the the the, the cradle of Islam in the British Isles, mm-hmm. uh, the yeah. birthplace of Islam in the British Isles, that we should do a podcast at that masjid about Sheikh Abdullah Quilliam and Allah has given us tawfiq today alhamdulillah wa shukrillah to, to do exactly now Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh to all the, all the watchers um, it truly is an honour to be here to discuss about Sheikh Abdullah Quilliam um, as, as was mentioned by Ustad in fact before I start for those watchers who are accustomed to watching I'm on good behaviour today. We're in a masjid. We're in a masjid <laughs> and we're, we're talking about, all the, all the subjects we, we've spoken about, they are serious subjects, but we have a very serious ustad slash sheikh in our presence. Stuck for <laughs> <a while>. <laughs> <laughs> Apologies, apologies. I wish that your children could hear this so they can start calling you sheikh. Yeah, uh, uh, I will never hear the end of it if you keep calling me sheikh, trust me. <laughs> That's a one-off. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, um, so normally we have a lot of banter, myself with Ustad, Yathrib, and also whoever else is here. Today I'm going to behave myself. Um, we'll see. <laughs> I'll try my best. <laughs> anyway. be I, I also have a sore throat as well, so that's the reason why I have to b- behave myself. But in terms of the subject itself of Sheikh Abdullah Kudim, we're going to hear from somebody who's, who's, um, who specializes and has an expertise as a historian who's researched the great Sheikh extensively. So the initial thing, there's two things I want to share, and then I will fall silent for most of this for most of this podcast. Um, I'm not I'm not sure exactly when, but I think it was around five years ago. Um, perhaps my main teacher, um, Sheikh Mohammed Samar Al Nas, who's from Damascus in Syria, he delivered a khutbah here in this very in this very space behind on one of his um, travels here, and. 
he indirectly, and for those who, who knew what, is, what he was um, alluding towards, they, they understood the point, but he was alluding towards Sheikh Abdullah Kulyam. And I'm going to quote the verse that he began the khutbah with and sent the khutbah around. Um, Surah Al-Ra'ad, which is in just 13 of the Quran. Surah Al-Ra'ad, verse 17. He quoted part of the verse. Said so the froth, I, the froth on 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 the the river of the sea, that goes away and has nothing. It has no lasting reality to it. But that which benefits people remains on earth. And the point that the sheikh he sent to the whole whole of this khutbah around was the rebirth of the masjid. So I think it's 2014, we have a plaque there. 2014, after almost a century lying lying deserted here. And I'm from Liverpool myself. So I remember when I was young in the 1980s, there was only one masjid here in Liverpool. It was a Rahma masjid, the central masjid. And we even then we always knew about there used to be a masjid here. At that time, this was the birth and death, death registry. So, and even myself, I used to go to school not far from here, so I used to pass on the bus all the time going here, but we never really truly understood the legacy that was here. And then it came back to life. And the point that the Sheikh made, And a sign of something about Sheikh Abdullah Quilliam being, if what he'd done was not truly from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it would have died a death with him. But over a century later, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala willed for it to, to return back, and that now we're all blessed and honored to be here in this masjid. I have, I have the ultimate honor with um, myself that every Friday I stand here in the footsteps of Sheikh Abdullah Kulyam. So that's how I want to start just for us to appreciate that the fact that this masjid came back into existence is perhaps the greatest sign that there is of what Sheikh Abdullah Kulyam was about. Allahu Akbar. MashaAllah. Jazakallah khairan, Sheikh Harun and... Um yeah, it's difficult to actually put it into words. It's, 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 subhanAllah, it's interesting, the ayah that you selected. It's something we often talk about as sadaqah jariyah. Mm-hmm. Like if it's yeah. truly something beneficial to people, there's a divine promise that it will, for yamkuthu fil ard, that it will mm-hmm. continue remain. to remain. And um, uh, beautifully, uh, connection. I, 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 and, you know, again, kind of trying to, very difficultly and emotionally, to put into words something about the feeling of being here, and specifically the place where we're sat. Filming the, the the podcast um, before we come to our esteemed guest, maybe I could share um, a couple of ayat um, which I'll mention in English to for brevity of time. Um, but these are found in uh, Surah An-Nur, the chapter mm-hmm. of light, chapter twenty-four, uh, verses uh, and ayat thirty-five to thirty-six. It, it just feels really appropriate to mention it here that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala mentions about him being the light of the heavens and the earth. And later on, he mentions Nur and Allah Nur, lights upon light. And Allah guides to his light whom he wills. And that's profound. And I, I believe Sheikh Abdullah Quilliam will, will actually lay that claim that he's the first of this, of this islands to indigenous people to, to be guided to Islam or to, to embrace the faith. And uh, Allah knows best. But then it goes on to ayat, goes on to say uh, in ayah 36 that this light, this divine light, continues to shine through the houses of worship, uh, which Allah has, uh, now it's arguable how you translate this, but generally they translate as ordered to be raised, but actually if you look directly it's at the permitted, Arabic, yeah, permitted uh, to. Uh, yeah, mm-hmm. Allahu an turfa, that Allah has granted permission mm-hmm. for these houses to be raised, these masajid to be raised, وَيُذْكَرَ fi husmuhu, and that his name be mentioned, and that is through divine permission, that those houses are erected Absolutely. and established and that his name, his divine name, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is mentioned here. And Allah goes on to say, he is glorified there morning and evening. And alhamdulillah, wa shukillah, we just had the honor of praying the Salat al-Dhuhr here within the Abdullah Kuliyam Masjid. And that brings me now beautifully on to our uh, esteemed guest and ustad, um, Sidi Yahya Burt, uh, who is a community historian who was taught at the University of Leeds in the UK. He has an MPhil in Social and Cultural Anthropology from the University of Oxford. He has published over a dozen peer-reviewed articles on Islam in Britain and co-edited British Secularism and Religion, Islam, Society and State. Uh, 
uh, in 2016, Islam in Victorian Liverpool, an Ottoman account of Britain's first uh, Muslim uh, mosque community in 2021, and the forthcoming The Collected Poems of Abdullah Quilliam, inshallah, which we hope to speak about in a separate podcast, inshallah. <coughs> um, Sidi Yahya Burt's commentary has been cited in several newspapers, including The Guardian, The Economist, The Intercept, and The Muslim News. The Economist themselves described our esteemed guest as an influential British Muslim, which no doubt he is. Assalamu alaikum, Ustad Yahya Bert. Wa alaikum salam, rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. We pray that you're well, inshallah. <laughs> Alhamdulillah, it's a great honor to be here. First time I've been back at the masjid since the COVID lockdown. So I'm, I'm really happy to be here. And, you know, I, I felt like it was a homecoming because in the three years since I was last here, I've been very much immersed in studying the history of this community. So I feel coming back <laughs> is like a homecoming because I feel like... I read about this room and I read about that corner and what happens here and so on. So it's it's really evocative, quite emotional for me uh, to return here. Marhaba so thank you for, may Allah bless you for inviting me here. No, no, and, khair. And, and it really was a discussion, but like I said, between Sheikh Huron and myself last time we were in Liverpool. And uh, we're just grateful to Allah SWT for bringing it into fruition. And we pray it benefits everybody who watches and listens, inshallah. Amen. So Ustad, um, and we're going to just mention some things of course we can't do justice to the the, the life of Sheikh Abdullah Quilliam uh, but uh, we'll try to dip in and out of to get some gleanings from his his life so if you could maybe start by talking about his uh, his early life like family and religious background and his time as a journalist and a lawyer Jazakallah khair well um, Sheikh Abdullah was born in 1856 in Liverpool um, he was born into a devout uh, Wesleyan Family. The Wesleyans were a Protestant sect, okay, one of the smaller ones, um, and they tended to have a um, progressive streak to them. So they were very much engaged in issues around social reform. Um, these things were very important in the new cities like Liverpool at the time, which was suffering from huge problems of unemployment and poverty, um, um, and various sort of social ills. Um, one of the main ones they campaigned against was was drink, the demon drink, as they called it. So, Abdullah uh, William Henry Quilliam, as he was born as a lad, uh, we'll, we'll call him William. So William was brought up as a uh, temperance campaigner, and he started young. At the age of six, he was already being reported in the Liverpool press for giving fiery speeches against the dangers of the demon drink. Oh, one of the cool. remarkable things about William. Um, Sheikh Abdullah is that the alcohol never passed his lips in his wow. entire life. Uh -huh. So he never uh -huh. drank. He always was a teetotaler. Um, and so uh, many years later when he became exposed to Islam, his first lecture he described it as the greatest teetotalist success in history. So Islam is the greatest temperance movement in history because that was the context out of which he came and a context that his Victorian audience in Liverpool would have understood. Mm. Um, and so um, he was precocious lad. He went to Liverpool College. He he gained first prize nationally in in geology. So he came first in the whole country. So obviously a very intelligent lad. Um, and he um, his father was a watchmaker of some distinction, um, who died in in eighteen eighty nine. Actually, the year that they moved here. Would it be arguable that they were from the upper to middle class? I would say wealth, wealthy middle class, yeah. wealthy. He's, 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 he married his mother, <coughs> his mother, whose father was a, a doctor, a medical doctor. Um, they, they, were, they were also devout, her, um, devout Methodists. And um, she has his mother, I think, I, I, I would argue, is probably maybe the biggest influence on William, Henry William, in the sense that she was a very uh, courageous campaigner for the rights of women. <laughs> um, uh, particularly with the C Contagious Diseases Act of 1869, which was a big call celebre nationally, and the campaign against that was led from Liverpool uh, by a famous woman called Josephine um, Baker. Now, uh, William's mother, Harriet, um, actually was the the chief, one of the chief officers of the Liverpool branch of that movement. And so um, William always uh, grew up with the greatest respect for women, and I believe that that came... Firstly, from his mother. 
Um, and um, so he, you know, he was educationally bright, and he, he basically, <laughs> as a young man, he he didn't go and do a degree, but he 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 set about a double career, um, both as a journalist uh, and as a lawyer, and he had noted success in both. Um, I, I guess we don't know so much about his early career as a journalist, but he wrote for both the serious local press as well as for the satirical press, and you can see that some of that humour comes through in the pages of his own newspaper, The Crescent, which he founded years later in 1893. Um, uh, as for a career as a lawyer, he, he, he did end up taking some famous murder cases uh, and getting people acquitted. And probably the most famous case he was involved in was involving the Irish dynamitards, um, a sort of early precursor of republican unrest where there was um, an attempted um, attempt attempt at um, you know what we would nowadays call a terrorist attack, and he was a defence lawyer for that case, um, and that got him noticed in London. Um, uh, he was also politically well politically connected because the first chambers where he trained at um, the head of that chamber was actually the Lord Conservative Tory Lord Mayor of the city. Um, Liverpool was a Tory city back then. I know it's hard to... Uh, <laughs> That's hard. unbelievable it's, now. It's unbelievable now, <laughs> yeah. but actually Toryism was politically ascendant uh, in Liverpool for, uh, for for quite a few decades, either side of the twentieth uh, beginning of the 20th century. Before that, it was more of a liberal town. Um, and before the Labour had emerged as a political party back then, it hadn't emerged as a strong political force until in Liverpool, really quite late and into the... Uh, 20th century um, so um, Quilliam was associated with the Tories as a young man in fact w one of the major members of the Liverpool mosque community himself joined with that was a, a chief officer of the cons conservative working men's association that Quilliam joined as a young man um, and the man who built the building next door that you're expanding into mm. John Holding uh, again an old friend of Quilliam's later Lord Mayor of the city um, uh, founder of Liverpool Football Club. Great um, man. Yeah, also great. great man. <laughs> That's music to easy. Great yeah. man. Was, was a close friend of Abdullah Williams, and they okay. both worked as part of the trade union is, is, movement. Is this why Sheikh Haroon went on to uh, then support so. that club? It yeah. must be for that reason, nothing else. Well, but the, there is a Liverpool FC connection, and, and it should okay. be played up a bit more. Um, uh, in fact, we, we need to do that because I've mentioned because you've got Mohamed Salah and you've got all of these great footballers, yeah. and they tend to go to other messages, they don't come here. Yeah. So there does need to be some type of connection that's built up yeah. with, with the club. Yeah, well, I tried, but um, we'll talk afterwards. But I tried to get, make that happen with, oh, okay. with some connections that I have with the club. So anyway, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll watch this space. We'll have another go, yeah, inshallah. Another question for you, Ustad. I've heard it said that he, he was very representative or, or, or taking cases um, even of, from the poor with no fee. Would that be fair to say as well? That the, 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 or was that later in his life? Yeah, I mean, he 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 took a whole range. Of, he took a lot of divorce cases as well. But he also did, as you say, as as a union. So he was a attorney for for some trade unions. So he would have taken up things like um, injury cases, um, you know, lack of pay, um, you know, those kinds of legal claims against employers who had, you know, usurped the rights of workers. So he would be the union, also he would negotiate on behalf of unions. So, yeah, I would say he was on the progressive side of the law, um, certainly. Uh, in divorce cases, there was a problem in that the you couldn't divorce without due cause. Um, so um, women were stuck in bad marriages quite often. So, you know, he would try to take up, what do what he could to defend women who were in difficult marriages. Um, so, so, you know, based upon that then, the establishment must, must have seen him in a very negative light. It, it almost sounds like he's always opposing the establishment. Well, he was a mix of being with the establishment, also being anti-establishment. <laughs> I mean, he was a clever guy. I mean, he, mm. he was, he was well-connected with the political class in the city, but that didn't stop him from being a campaigning lawyer at the same time. So he was clever at, 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 at you know, working the scene, if, if I can yeah. put it that way. You know, he... He was trusted and he was a troublemaker at the same mm -hmm. time. I, I, and he kind of managed to do both, mm. which is quite a feat, I think. Quite so difficult to do that. Uslad, you know, um, at what point uh, does young William, or now going into his late 20s, maybe in into his uh, early 30s now, encounter <coughs> Islam? At what point does that happen? Where does he, does he 
Uh, I assume it's not in Liverpool, though it could be uh, maybe through the, the Muslim sailors that are arriving into the Liverpool city, or is it when he goes abroad and visits Muslims in, the, in Muslim countries in North Africa? And at what point does that happen? Yeah, well, I mean, as I was saying, he, he had a double career as a learn, lawyer and a journalist, <coughs> and he, he, he overworked his whole life. I mean, he is a man of formidable energy, but he actually worked himself into illness on several occasions, sure. and so... He became ill through overwork, and his doctor ordered him to take a holiday. Yeah, and and so and young w- William, who's probably in his thirties by now, um, decided to go to Gibraltar um, because of his passion for ge- geology. We heard earlier he he won a national prize in geology. He wanted to go study the rocks. So when he got to Gibraltar, he, he thought, "Oh, you know, I'm so close to Mor- Morocco. Why don't I just take <laughs> the boat across and have a look?" And on doing that, he encountered a party of hajis uh, coming back, either going to or back from the hajj, I can't remember which now. And they, 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 they introduced him to Islam. They, they made him say the shahada. Um, uh, and, um, but he said to them that, look, you know, I, 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 you know, I, I like everything you've said, and, and it's very appealing to me, but I, I'd like to go back and study um, a bit more myself. And that's actually what he did. So he, this is in 1883, uh, January 1883, when he went to Morocco for, for you know, a few weeks or whatever it was. Um, and then he um, he comes home, he studies on his own, he studies different religions, not just Islam, um, and mostly studies it through Orientalist texts in translation. So George Sale's translation of the Qur'an, um, which was from 1734, um, uh, uh, Washington uh, Irving's Life of the Prophet. These are the kinds of sources that he was using. Um, and, and by 1886, he privately converts to Islam. But what makes the Sheikh, I think, an historic figure and, and marks him out really as a founding figure is that he doesn't just leave it there like most of us do. He decided he, he was on a bound duty bound to preach Islam to his people to call them to Islam no, like you said I mean you could just leave that in your private devotion and only your well, family that's what most, only know most converts most converts you know don't you know there are many quiet converts out there but he decides to um, preach Islam and so the next year in, in 1887 he gives his first speech which is recorded uh, verbatim and publishes a pamphlet later on called Fanatics and Fanaticisms of the first Dawah lecture, if you like, in the history of Islam in, in England. Why did, is he, why did he call it that? Like, that's a very interesting name to, if you're calling people to Islam, do we have any idea why he chose that as the, his, the name of his first but, but, Well, but it's, it's, not, it's not directly about Islam. It, 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 it comes to Islam right towards the end. Oh. It's, it, it's coming about, it's an indirect method of dawah that he developed because he found that when he was initially talking to people straight on about Islam, he would often get ridiculed and rejected and so on. Mm. He decided that a, a roundabout way of introducing Islam was much more effective. And so what he did really was talking about was actually people fanatical in their love of alcohol okay. and alcoholism. Okay. And actually the opposite, what is actually that, that's a kind of a fanaticism that needs to be overturned and moderance and temperance uh, should should be, should be reclaim the center stage. And, and where was that lecture? Was that right here? It wasn't. Are, it wasn't or? here. It was in rented premises in Mount Vernon Street, okay. yeah. nearby. And um, they they used those rented premises for a couple of years before moving here. So you know, like many new communities in Britain from back in the day, they rented premises for Julma before they yeah. ever ever rented or owned a place of their own. So it's a very familiar story. And of course, let's think about it. The first mosque in Britain was a house mosque, like many early mosques in Britain, you know? So that, that is very much part of our tradition, so the house that, mosque. Right? It sounds like it's our urf. It's our urf. Yeah. It's, our, it's our custom. It is our custom. And, and so it's Can part I just of uh, add a comment on that? Um, what fascinated me there is how you described how um, Abdullah Quilliam continued in many ways how he was before Islam, into Islam. And it reminded me of the hadith where the Prophet said, so so An-Nasu kal ma'adin. Are people like minerals. Mm-hmm. The best of them before Islam are the best of them within Islam if they, when they understand, if they understand. So what, what you often tend to find, people who, who adopt Islam and come into Islam, the way that they are before Islam will carry over into Islam. Mm-hmm. It's just about changing their beliefs and refining certain aspects of their practices. But then the essential character and traits and behaviors, that mm-hmm. continues within Islam. And that seems to be what's happened with um, Sheikh Abdullah Quilliam. 
like all of that activism there. Mm. He didn't become Muslim and just put that all away. He he took that into Islam with him. Yeah, this is this is probably the thing that that's most different from from his time to ours is that now we're over three million Muslims mm. counting, and <laughs> in his days there were less than ten thousand Muslims, oh, and you know probably like a mix of a wealthy. Sh- um, undergraduate students who'd come to study in the British universities as I mentioned earlier the Lascars the the oriental sailor, sailors who came through this great port this great port of empire um, you know from Somalia land from the Yemen from Bengal so when you say 10,000 you don't mean indigenous white 10,000 no no no, no I, I, from it. it's just I, the Muslim community the, the different people who here. came to study and work <laughs> yeah. here temporarily or whatever um, you know settled communities were only really just beginning to start and this was one of them obviously and um, this was the first you know and there was a core here of the converts that Quilliam had called but then there was a population coming in and out the whole time of born Muslims who were coming in and out of, of so, Liverpool. So when does the Sheikh establish the masjid that we're in right now? He he he. They move in here in December eighteen eight the twentieth of December eighteen eighty nine. Eighteen eighty nine. Yeah, it's when they move in. How long was that after he became Muslim? Well, he he became Muslim in eighteen eighty six, but he only started preaching in eighteen eighty seven. So mm-hmm. about two and a half years before they move in here, and they had those rented premises first. In 1887, so that's why I call it England's first mosque community because the community starts in 1887. This masjid is begun in 1889. So, okay, if, if, if does that go, make sense? Yeah, yeah, it does. Yeah, yeah if, it if does. we go back to that 1889, what does what functions uh, have been established by Sheikh Abdullah Quliam in this masjid here? What 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 sort of so were there services that were offered to the local community? What, 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 what would, if we typically walked here in 1889, what would we expect to see? Um, sorry, before answering that, can I just throw something else okay. in? What was it that, what was the clincher for him in terms of becoming Muslim? From, um, and how significant was the fact that he didn't touch alcohol beforehand in him becoming Muslim? I mean, I think that was very significant. The other thing as well is that, you know, he always defended polygamy. And he oh, wow. already had um, two families by this time. Sure. Okay, so he had a as a Muslim or before? Before he had oh. two families. Okay, we one need to revive one, that, don't one, we? One, 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 <laughs> one, one was a com- obviously not legally married; they were common law wife. But he kept yeah. it with the family. So you know, he had two. You know, he had, he had a, a legal wife, and he had what's known as a common law wife. Okay, and um, he contracted an Islamic marriage to to her once. You know, after after conversion, after his conversion, with his second family. The first, his first wife never converted to Islam, but his second wife did. Sorry, on that point, then was that was without opening up the the, the whole thing of polygamy, was that something that was normal within um, within English society at that time? I don't think so. No, I think that it was something it, for him to defend that in the ways that he did. It meant that he wasn't a hypocrite because he was he was preaching what he practiced or practicing okay, what he preached. That's great to know. But, that's great to know. But, but, but it wasn't a popular, I don't think it was a particular popular stand that he mm. took at the time. So uh, just going back to the services that were here well, and, and yeah, also the reaction of the Liverpool community to that. Yeah, I mean, look, you know, the first few years here were difficult for them. So um, as, um, you know, they, they called the Adhan out aloud in this mosque and they called it from the first floor yeah. of this building out onto the street, which was a very busy thoroughfare of the city. So would it be fair to say that this would be the location of the so first public Adhan? Sorry, didn't they used to get attacked with that? Well, that's yeah, that, I recall. Th- that's right. The, the, the Muazzam was attacked. He was injured. His name was uh, Arthur Hassan Radford. He was by profession a marine boiler riveter. <laughs> Okay, who travelled and had become interested in other religions, and he was the first name Muazzam of the masjid. There were two others after him, and uh, you know he, you know he was injured, and it was widely reported in the Muslim world um, that incident. Um, also, they came in and they disrupted services and so on. So things were very rocky for the first five years or so, and things did calm down after that. Um, um, but you know, the, it wasn't explicitly. Um, named as a masjid at the beginning so in the first few years it was sort of called the church of islam <laughs> and they held like divine services on a sunday you know also oh, uh, they called it that themselves they called it you? that but then oh, it oh. changed over to quite about 1892 93 the sign outside changed it was then called a mosque 
Um, and the reason why for all of this, I think, to try and understand it, is that you had a self-taught man, a brilliant man, but self-taught from Orientalist sources, piecing together what he thought Islam might look like in terms of service and worship without much outside influence or support. Then what happens, the, 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 because Quilliam supports the first uh, a campaign against a play of the Prophet Muhammad in London, which came out in 1890, which was seen as um, disrespectful and sacrilegious, he and other Muslims in Britain at the time protested against the play, argued that it should be banned. And for that, they gained the attention and support of the caliph. It sounds and, a little uh, bit like the Salman Rushdie affair, right? In the sense that... Yeah, well, it, pre, it, it, it is an echo of that from the past. And um, so the, 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 in, uh, Sultan Abdul Hamid actually registers his complaint. And actually, on, on the basis of his intervention, the, 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 um, the, the play is banned from the London stage. Wow. So, so um, and this is how Quilliam and the Liverpool Muslims come to the attention of the caliph and of the world of Islam, the wider world this of is Islam. the last sultan of the Ottoman Empire, Sultan Abdul Hamid II. That's right. Yeah. So, 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 so the thing is, at this point, they become international news. And, and so they start getting a lot of visitors. So they see the visitors, Muslim, Orthodox Muslims will come and they'll see this rather hybrid sort of Christian form of services and so on and say, look, you know, this isn't really the way you should be going about it. So over time, they begin to develop more Orthodox practice. So you have to see that, that, that this was a community that was on a learning curve mm. over time mm, yeah. and had, had adopted Islam as far as they could understand it from sort of Orientalist sources and things that they might have picked up here and there. But really there was no one there to guide them. In fact, some of the Indian associations in India did send um, some an alam, Malana Barakatala, sent him, and he was here for three years between 1893 and 1896 to teach fundamentals to the converts and so on. About about prayer and ablutions and so on and so forth. So, just, so, go ahead. so, so what comes to mind there then, which is an issue which is relevant um, now, the identity of that community once once they start adopting practices more in line with the orthodox way, do they still have a clearly identifiable British Muslim? Um, or or uh, do, is that identity still clearly there, or are now they, are they beginning to within their cultural practices change and become? become more Indian or more, more Turkish or more Moroccan? I mean, I, I think they very clearly were adhering to their British custom in the way they dressed and their manners and mores and so on, and in ways that would sometimes upset, um, you know, if you like, Muslims coming from the East, mm -hmm. if I can put it that way. Um, and they still were a bit uneasy with the cultural practices of the, of the, the small community here. Um, and some of them are detailed in, in the book that we've translated here, which is um, by an Ottoman traveller, Yusuf Sami Asmai, who came in 1895 okay. and left his own account of his 30-day stay here. So it's a very, you know, a very in interesting text. Sorry, so this is a Muslim shop book, right? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think they'll understand that joke. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, there was this one guy uh, he, online, he said he only wanted to buy the book because this guy here, this convert, um, um, uh, Jamal Adin Bukhari Jeffrey, he only bought it because he had the mutton chops, which is the way that Victor some Style Victorian the, uh, men used to, used to cut their facial hair. Um, so so what, 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 uh, what, what's the name of the book, Ustad? Uh, it's called Islam in Victorian Liverpool, an Ottoman account of Britain's first mosque community. So again, you know, the, this 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 book captures um, th that kind of tension between Muslims coming from the east, expecting things to be done a certain way, and finding that you know um, that the community—it's a young community that still has a lot to learn—and um, those tensions are picked up in this account. So, does so. Sheikh Abdullah Quilliam uh, um, actually visit uh, the Sultan Abdul Hamid II in 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 Istanbul? Uh, is there, is there an actual physical encounter? Yeah, so he's invited, days? officially invited, and he visits, the first visit is in 1891, um, and I think is I, I may be wrong, I think is he did a, does a number of visits, I think it's four or five, I can't remember the exact number, I think his last official visit was in eight, uh, 1905, um, and... Um, when you, you know, say official visits, is yeah, it on officially of invited, or? Officially invited, yeah, right. by the Ottomans, yeah. Um, and he meets the he certainly meets the caliph at least twice, at least oh, sure. twice personally, 
um, and, and they have a correspond. You know, they have a personal correspondence as well. Um, we don't have Quilliam's letters from the Caliph or, or from the Ottomans you receive from Ottoman officials, but we do. The Ottoman archive does preserve Quilliam's letters. So, uh, how does uh, the? Uh, yeah, so, if you don't mind, I have two questions on that about his um, his contact with the with the Caliph of the time. Um, First of all, was he appointed as Sheikh al Islam the British Isles during his contacts? Was that something that was that came later? And yeah, like second, basically, how was he viewed? That's kind of what yeah, I was. Yeah, no, he 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 was he was his community elected him here in this room in eight, October eighteen ninety four. Elected him as Sheikh al Islam of the British Isles. Oh. So it was by an election of the members here. Um, uh, can we elect one of us now to be Sheikh Lissam of the British Isles here? Well, you know, it's... it's <laughs> I've got a great candidate right here. Yeah, uh, this man, we'll appoint you. We'll anoint you, Sheikh Lissam. No, no, no. I mean, we all joke today about who is going to be the head mufti and everything. Yeah, <laughs> we, struck, uh, yeah we have but, arguments over imams. Never mind. But, but, but the thing is, the thing is actually, uh, joking aside, actually, we probably the only option we have today in the absence of a great patron... There's no caliphate today. Mm -hmm. Is self-authorization. -author we must come together as a community and select somebody who we all respect more or less to, to provide some 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 grounding and some authority in some of the uh, sort of main elements of, of Muslim collective life. And, and, the, and the, I'll the, not nominate to say yes, Rabbi is the first of them. <laughs> this is what I mean. The jokes start straight away yeah. because we're so diverse. I've been behaving. <laughs> I've been we're on so good behaviour so far. No, no, but we're so diverse and we're so we're so we're so disparate. We can't <laughs> think it's possible. It's possible to us agree on anything at all. Yeah. But, but the truth is, is that there were so few Muslims back then. I guess this kind of thing was possible then. But the thing is that you know, underlining that, you know, would you like in Bosnia? In Bosnia, when the caliphate ended, they ended up saying that the the Ra'is al ulama okay, which was a, a position that was originally recognized by by the caliph, by Abdul Hamid II. Okay, when when the caliphate was ended in 1924, the Bosnian ulama decided that they would actually, amongst their peers, choose somebody, mm. and continue to wait until the reappearance of the caliphate. Oh. But in the interim, they would continue to vote in their own, uh, you know, whoever was most fitting for that position. So they they, they took a route of self-authorization. So I don't think self-authorization is necessarily the problem if we take ourselves seriously. Mm -hmm. We have to enact authority so ju ju ourselves. Just on that point, but obviously now you've got self-authorization in Victorian Britain. How does the the head of the Muslim world, Sultan Abdul Hamid, view that? Yeah, that's what I'm going to ask now, the follow-on okay. from that. Yes. Is that now recognized as a formal position in the Ummah? Uh, I mean... It's a difficult question. A difficult question that uh, uh, the short answer is yes and no. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so in Ottoman documents, there's no mention. They make a point of never recognizing using that title in respect of him. Mm -hmm. um, they would just call him like president of the of the uh, of the Liverpool Muslim Institute and things like that. Not even sheikh um, in the Ottoman official documents. Um, but uh, what we can see is that that term, Sheikh al Islam of the British Isles, he was recognized, that term was addressed by that term by the Emir of Afghanistan. And ulama in the Arab world, and ulama in, the, in, in Persia, and ulama in, in, in the Indian subcontinent all wrote about him using that title. So, so there mm. was some recognition from ulama, there was some recognition from the Emir of Afghanistan. We haven't found evidence of any like th third party evidence. I mean, outside of Quilliam's own publications, other people having recognized the term. I, I, is there any point where the, the, the caliph. And the Ottomans never object. That's, that, so that's they don't the, object. They don't object, point. but they don't recognize either officially. So I think that they decided that it was something that they. It was, it, you know, the presence of, of a Muslim community in Britain was a far greater fact and importance than to undermine it mm -hmm. I think they had no interest in undermining it and the thing is that this book which was critical of, of Quilliam you know the Caliph banned it in 1898 <laughs> prob probably at Quilliam's re re um, request in 1898 because it was critical and um, 
you know, so that shows that they, they saw the value and importance of this community. Sorry, I didn't catch that. This book was banned by the Khalifa. The Khalifa. Yeah, it was banned oh. in 1898, yeah. Mm. Uh, um, You're promoting banned books, are you? <laughs> yes, that's right, yeah. I'm translating them. <laughs> because as Quilliam says, the importance of freedom of speech and association is very important for the welfare of the Ummah. And that is the argument that he makes, just not in respect of this book. But anyway, um, the point the point is, is that he... The point is, is that they they recognised his their importance and value of this community, but but not in the they didn't recognise the title. Jazakallah khairan, Ustad. We're just going to momentarily break for Salat Asr here in in the Masjid. That we an honour again to pray here in this space, which is the old the oldest uh, interspace here on the British Isles where Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is is mentioned. And then we'll carry on straight after that. You're inshallah. listening to yeah. Sunnah Stream, a podcast exploring the prophetic way. Bismillahi wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillahi wa ba'd Welcome back um, We just performed our salat asr here Alhamdulillah A huge honour Privilege to be here uh, In the Sheikh Abdullah Quilliam Masjid The first operational public masjid In the entire uh, British Isles um, We're back with our uh, co-hosts and guests uh, Sheikh Haroon and uh, Ustad Yahya Bert Assalamu alaikum Alaikum um, We were just talking before um, about Sheikh Abdullah Quilliam, and I think one of the questions we we're just discussing in between as well is, did uh, Sheikh Abdullah Quilliam actually have a uh, a formal teacher? Because you said that a lot of early Islam yeah. people self-taught. Um, did did he have an early teacher or later on in life? I mean, I think self-study was his his mode. His operations, because he he in later life he ranged over a huge number of subjects as well outside of Islam, like compared to religion. He wrote, um, he prepared a book on the religions of Japan. You know, he wrote very very. He wrote on also Jewish law. I mean, he he wrote on a whole series of subjects. So his whole life he was self taught. But having said that, he ulama came to visit him in Liverpool. He had an ear for languages. You know, he picked up a lot from them. Um, so I don't know if he had a formal teacher, but certainly he had encounters with ulama over time, and he visited Istanbul on at least four to five occasions. I can't remember the exact number right now, but so would, um, would it be fair to oh, say? Sorry, so was, so yeah, said, yeah. Said, based upon that, then uh, perhaps you can ask this. Um, he was not really then considered to be from the ulama, was he? Was he more of a community leader rather than? A no, I, I. I mean, I think he was seen as a kind of like a alama type of figure in the sense that he had a very wide knowledge and that was kind of recognised and respected. I mean, he mm-hmm. wasn't an alam, but he was a kind of an alama okay. in, in the sense of being, you know, a very very widely knowledgeable about a whole range of different subjects. You know, did so he, so I, sh- yeah, p- people respected him. Uh, for his learning, but they didn't consider him and him an alim as such in a formal sense. Yeah, right. no, no. I mean, he, he, he. Th- th- we've never found the ijaza. There is, a, there, there. You know, mm-hmm. around eighteen ninety three, he's supposed to have gotten an an honorary ijaza from 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 uh, from the Karawiyin and Fez. Oh, but we've yeah. never been able to find the Arabic corroborations for that. And the thing is, an honorary. Ijaza could mean something simple like you you can preach Islam or something like that. Mm-hmm. I mean, I you know you don't get an honorary alamiya as you don't get honorary sure. like an honorary doctorate. It doesn't make any sense in the Islamic tradition. So we're not sure what this means, other than the fact that maybe he was given some general ijaza to preach Islam. But then this is like a kind of a blessing because obviously it's a duty on everyone to uh, to, to to preach to preach Islam. And so in terms of like his <coughs> creedal basis is he's, he would be considered as a Sunni Orthodox Hanafi Muslim? Yeah, he said that the the, the, the Salah, the formal Salah was um, uh, uh, was run according to the Hanafi school uh, of jurisprudence and God bless him. And and cer- <laughs> certainly <laughs> says the cer- teacher of Hanafi fiqh. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> cer- certainly certainly um, there is a pr- the first devotional prayer, um, a how-to prayer manual that I've ever seen published from England. It was published from the Institute in, in 1906 called Muslim Liturgical Practices. Okay. Um, and, and so it is basically, I've gone through that, it is basically Hanafi fiqh as far sure. as I can tell. So and in terms of the services of the masjid, yeah. like when it was at its full in terms of like the, the services that were offered here, and I know over years it developed, what what sort of things were going on in this space? Well, I think like in, in the full range of activities was amazingly broad. 
even by today's standards. So they had adult education classes, they ran an orphanage, they had a school for children, a day oh. school. Was this the Medina House? That yeah, Med- the Medina House for orphans. Um, by the way, a beautiful name. Yeah, they, 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 they also, um, um, from right from early on, one of the early practices uh, was feeding the, the, the poor and the homeless on Christmas Day mm-hmm. itself, and that became a custom of this masjid, which has now been continued, you know, alhamdulillah, yes. was continued when the mosque was reborn, as Sheikh was saying earlier, you know, that that's that practice of Sheikh Abdullah was reborn as well in this masjid, and I, I like to think that's a really fine thing that, that our British, modern day British Muslims have carried on Sheikh Abdullah's Quilliam's tradition of feeding the poor and the homeless. I'm, I'm proud that we do that as a community. And um, what sort of effect did that have on, on the non Muslim Liverpoolian community? Um, I think that that early hostility faded in the you know after five or six years because they did serve the poor of the local community you know and um, they fed them they edu- they provided free education classes um, they did a lot of pastoral work and I think that in, and Sheikh Abdullah himself as I mentioned earlier was a very uh, committed trade unionist and and was the president and solicitor for a very large trade union in the city the Carters Union. So the carters were the ones who loaded the unloaded the boats and put put the goods into the warehouses or it took it to the railway stations. Had over five thousand members and he served them for for two for two decades. So he you know he did a lot of work in the city as well as his legal practice. As I said, he was a ball of energy. He did so much in his life. I don't know how he found the time, but but he his his tradition of activism and service to the community at large it never finished with his conversion to Islam. In, any, in anything, is, as the Sheikh was saying earlier, Islam sort of enhanced yeah. his, his pre-existing um, uh, predilection for service, if that makes sense. So he and, always and continued with the, that. The, 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 so with a, a whole array of services, um, mm. is this funded by the, 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 the Victorian Muslim community in combination with also patrons from around the Muslim world? <laughs> yeah, we, we don't know the exact story of the finances because we don't have the um, the accounts no longer exist. But certainly there were local donations and there were donations from abroad. We can say that much. We, we uh, don't know, you know, I mean, I, I haven't made a close study of it, sure. but but it, it would need more investigation. We were just discussing in the break as well that... Um, were there any occasions where the the then caliph, the last caliph, uh, Sultan Abdul Hamid um, did he at any point um, send Sheikh Abdullah Quilliam anywhere uh, on 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 his behalf or you mean any to represent any, any represent official the, the caliphate? Uh, to, yeah, any official roles? Well, um, at least twice. Um, so the first time was in 1894. He was asked to um, present um, a, a medal and an award to Muhammad Shita Bey, who had, was opening a mosque in Lagos, which still exists today, the, the Muhammad Shita Bey uh, Masjid in Lagos. And he went as the Caliph's representative. And um, it was a big deal. Thousands turned out, such was their honour and respect for the Caliph mm. uh, and his representative. Um, and that's another whole podcast in itself, Sheikh Abdullah's relationship with Africa and and with you know the famous Pan-African Nissan Wilmot Blyden and, and so on and all the work he did in Africa so that's another separate podcast um, but um, uh, the second time was in 1905 where he was sent as a, uh, uh, really to report back to the caliph on the state of unrest in, the, in Wallachia which is one of the Ottoman uh, provinces in, um, in, in southeastern Europe and um, in the area of sort of modern-day Bulgaria. So he went with a detachment and was um, to, to report on the levels of unrest there. Um, there is a rather colourful account of that um, that expedition um, from 1905, which was appeared in a magazine called The Worldwide Magazine, which is on my blog. I, I've put a copy of it on my blog. If you Google... How do we find that blog? Just in service of the Sultan, Abdullah Quilliam. If you Google that, you'll get that article and you can read the account of that of that expedition. Um, so, you know, yes, he didn't have... He didn't He didn't formally... wasn't granted this title, Sheikh al-Islam of the British Empire. But yes, uh, Abdul Hamid II was his patron. Um, he did financially support the orphanage. 
Um, he did um, send him on missions to represent him occasionally. He did give him medals, and he did give uh, medals to his son, and his son was appointed as an Ottoman official. He worked at the Liverpool uh, Trade Console after 1900. Um, that's his son, Robert Ahmed Quilliam. So, yes, yes, he was recognised in those senses. Yeah. And um, if we just fast forward it to 1908, uh, Sheikh Abdullah Quilliam, with, I believe, his eldest son, uh, are invited to, or, or leave to uh, Istanbul. Um, what effect did uh, Sheikh Abdullah Quilliam's uh, departure from the Liverpool community have on this area that we're in right now? Well, I mean, I think it was it was um, a dark day, really, because um, the, the Liverpool Muslim community, such as it was, was left without its imam and and shortly thereafter without a mosque because the mosque was sold off um, by Bilal, uh, Bilal Quilliam, um, uh, Sheikh Abdullah's second son, who had also trained as a solicitor, um, and he, it was sold off to the council, where it remained as a council property until it was, it was um, you know, uh, given back to the Muslim community and to the Abdullah Quilliam Society. Um, and eventually, as we heard earlier, was reopened as a masjid in 2014. So um, it's only had th three or four owners, you know. So, and this is from like the 1830s, I think, the building originally. That's right. Yeah, that's right. And um, do, what do we hear about Sheikh Abdullah Quilliam after that? Does he does he come back to Liverpool? Um, does he move to other parts of the country? Where does he end up? Well, he I mean he he. It's it's probably it should be the subject of another podcast. But but in in brief, he you know he lives for another twenty five years after he leaves Liverpool in nineteen eighty eight, and the vast majority of that time, um, at least twenty years or so, he uh, or more he lives in London, uh, in Bloomsbury, where he establishes a learned society, um, and expands his academic interests and does a lot of writing. Um, also, he's still involved, not in a premier role that he had in Liverpool, but definitely as a grand old man of British Islam, if you like. He's still involved with the Muslims in London and also with the Woking Mosque. When it when it becomes active after 1913. And um, uh, also, I should say that he, he did also lead Juma prayers in London for a short time in Bloomsbury in his own house. So he used his own house as a masjid. Um, you know, in, during the war, during the First World War, and the, the Sheikh himself, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, is is buried in an unmarked grave in Woking. Is that correct? That's right. Yeah, that's right. Well, one of the project dreams we have is to put is to locate it and to. It, that's very difficult to do. Believe me, we've tried. Um, but but by process of eliminating, identifying all the others, we may identify his as the remaining one. Um, but we would like to put a permanent uh, gravestone over it because for people to remember him and say a fatiha for him and so on when they go yeah, to yeah. Woking. Yeah. Because think, otherwise, uh, I think it's not right that people could come and go and not know that the sheikh was buried there. Absolutely. And one of the isharas or indications is that uh, uh, the late great Mamadou Pigtal, Ali, the first Muslim Quran translator himself, is in the same graveyard. Is that correct? Yeah, along, and two translators of the Quran are buried alongside each other, Mashallah. Abdullah Yusuf Ali and, oh. and Imam Mamadou <laughs> Pigtal, as well as Lord Headley. And Hassan Lagai Eaton is buried is buried there, um, you know. So that many luminaries are buried there. It's worth a, a journey just to go over there as well. You know. So let, we'll take it to the modern time, uh, and now we really are fast forwarding. Like you've alluded to there, that uh, the British Muslim community here in Liverpool now, the, it, it, would it be say, fair to say that he passed away in 1935, and maybe um, there were his presence became unknown in the city. Uh, I think we discussed that there was a big Masjid, Masjid al-Rahma in, in, in Liverpool in the 1960s. Um, where, where does his name re-emerge? I suppose that's a question. And, and what do the British Muslims do about it in the city? Yeah, well, I mean, basically there's sort of two tracks, really. One is the Liverpool track. So uh, Muhammad Akram Khan Chima, who's doing a, an MA in education, he's decided to do it on the, on, on the Liverpool Muslims. And he goes to the central library and he finds copies of the Crescent um, and discovers this that there was an early community here. So he informs, you know, uh, Akbar Ali, the, the late Akbar Ali, and others about this. Um, and Akbar Ali sort of stows that away in his mind. 
And, um, you know, decades later, that bears fruit when the Abdullah Quilliam Society is formed in the late 90s. A plaque is put outside. The McTeers also played a role in that, uh, raising that early awareness. Um, Sonia and Rashid McTeer, who did a lot of re- uh, research. Oh, they're part of the olive tree shop down. That's yeah. right, yeah. yeah so yeah. They, they did some early research in the 80s. Um, and Ron Jeeves, Professor Ron Jeeves, plays a role because he... When he came to Liverpool Hope University, he Akbar Ali encouraged him to, they, they hatched a plan to do research. And Ron said, well, you know, if you make people know the man, then they'll care about the masjid, if you see what I mean. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. let's focus on the man. And so he wrote his biography, which I had commissioned when I was working at Q Publishing. This is back in 2010. Yeah, and which came out in 2010, which did a huge yeah. amount to raise uh, new awareness about uh, Abdullah Quilliam nationally. And, um, you know, he did dozens of speaking events, and I think that really raised awareness uh, back then. And the launch, uh, Mottman, which Mottman hosted, was in um, uh, the university, wasn't it, uh, back in 2010? Um, so, you know, a, a lot of people have made efforts to to, to kind of uh, remind people of, of this fascinating community. So what's and beautiful man. here is I have, I, I think we mentioned it, I, I can see the plaque directly in front of me, that um, the reopening of the masjid, uh, took place um, 106 years after uh, it had passed from Muslim ownership uh, by the late Dr. Muhammad Akbar Ali. May Allah have mercy upon him. He was the founder of the Abdullah Quilliam Society. And we've got Mart here, mashallah. I can see I'm literally reading from it. It's on Friday, the 27th of June, 2014, the 29th of Sha'aban, the day before Ramadan in the year 1435 after Hijrah. Yeah. And um, Sheikh Arun, let me bring you back in here. Mm-hmm. Were you there? At the opening? Um, I, I don't actually recollect if I was there for the actual opening. Um, if, um, honestly, I have no recollection of that. What's your first the, memory of coming here? Um, it was a Jum'ah khutbah. Okay. I wasn't doing the khutbah. There was, a, there was an initial imam who did the khutbah. But I think that was temporary. And then Moomin and um, Ghalib Khan and Dr. Abdul Hamid, those who were involved in the masjid, they asked me and they convinced me to come and do... And take this the position. After your own studies in in Syria, you've yeah. come back. Yeah, yeah. So, I'd already been engaged in teaching and other activities around Liverpool and the north, um, north of England. But so, uh, what, what what's your feeling as being the khatib of yeah, this, see, see, very this is, historic masjid? Yeah, see, I mean, I'm blessed and fortunate from Allah Subhanahu wa Taala to be engaged in so much, so much um, teaching and da'wah and good practice. But for me, this is the crown. This is the crown jewel of everything that I do. The fact that uh, I'm, I've been allowed and being given that permission to stand in the footsteps of somebody who truly is a great man and somebody that likes of a study Ahiyabet is, is and others around along with him, I begin to bring back to life something about who he was. And even though, as was mentioned, he's not technically formally like an animal scholar, but his legacy is truly great. And that's why we mentioned at the beginning. The sign of, of who he was is the fact that there's a rebirth that's taking place. And for me personally, every Friday coming, and it's been, I think, and now it's, it's close to six or seven years, perhaps, 2014. Um, yeah, so it's close to seven years that I've had the honor Friday after Friday. That initially here, initially it was here. For many a year it was here, standing here. And then more recently, we moved into into the extension part of it. I remember the, my first visit to the masjid. This is only my second. You were leading the Juma prayer and yeah. brought the family. And I just thought it was, it was a place of barakah because on that same day, somebody t- took shahada. Yeah, uh, yeah, I remember that. Shahada, shahada. I, remember shahada. I just thought, what but, but that for me, that for me is is the most powerful thing that I'm, I've been allowed to engage in. And as long as they allow me to keep on coming, that's not something I'm going to move away from. Um, because because I, I have to do Juma anyway, <laughs> so why not stand? <laughs> why not in, in stand the first in the foot? place? Yeah, in the footsteps the of such a great man. So it truly is it truly is a badge of honor for me that I'm able to stand every Friday and represent. and represent the great Imam. He used to read the the khutbah and mention the names of uh, Abdul Hamid, and he mentioned Abdul Rahman, the Emir of Afghanistan, and he mentioned Queen Victoria. Okay. He's asking if you follow us on that. Do you uh, mention okay. any, who do you mention in your khutbah? Uh, and Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He's the leader. Of what, the what are you asking me, Prince Charles and Queen Elizabeth II? Uh, uh, okay. What I'm are you d- asking? Me? It's just a bit of banter, actually. Does it? <laughs> I'll make a note of. <laughs> no, uh, truly uh, is an honour. Ustad Yahya, 
what lessons can we learn as British Muslims? No doubt uh, some of us came here uh, with our parents uh, thinking we'll go back, <laughs> back to wherever, be it Asia or Africa or, you know, wherever we, you know, the, the, the population migrated from. Um, what are the, the burning lessons we can learn in our modern times of the life and times of Sheikh Abdullah Kulian? Uh, well, uh, you know, there's a lot, but um, let me name a couple. Um, he, never, he, he never left his community of birth. He never left his customs. He, is, he, just, he knew that Islam would beautify them and, and, and enhance them. And, and he, 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 he wanted to bring his community with him into Islam. So that spirit is something we really need to recapture. It's important for us that, that, that Islam can be a religion of this land. It's not a foreign religion. It's, it's a universal religion. It, it, it's at home everywhere. And so Islam can be at home in these islands. And I think Abdullah Quilliam is, is our great trailblazer in that regard. Um, so I think the, the second thing I would say, it's not how much you know, it's acting on what you know. Mm. So the so the sheikh is a sheikh, not by formal ijazah, but because you know he had courage to preach Islam when... The whole when it was a strange alien religion to his whole community, he took that stand and he started to call people to Islam. Bismillah, he started, and he didn't look back. And Allah blessed him with tawfiq, and, and so many people came to Islam at his hands. Hundreds, you know, we don't know the exact number, but you know, to have done it at a time when there was so much hostility to the Muslims as as a clone colonized peoples and you know the arrogance of British civilization being the greatest in the world and all other civilizations being backwards. You know, he took that message of Islam as the final and universal religion, you know, with, with courage. And I think it's that courage that will give us heart and give us courage to try and undertake similar attempts now. When there are more than three million Muslims now, what are we waiting for? He did it when there was no no one but him. So what are we waiting for? So just as, as a final word, if possible, just to add on to that. Um, that for, uh, uh, like what, what, what's been discussed here today is such an eye-opener for, for many. Because for many Muslims, and I'm talking about the Muslim com community, we live in our Muslim ghettos, both cultural as well as religious ghettos. And we don't look beyond. But when we realize that uh, that the history of Islam didn't start with, with, with the community that came into these lands. It predated them and it was there before. And what seems fascinating about that early community, the initial community of Muslims in, this, in, in these lands, was that they had that identity of British Muslims. Without, uh, what, what Ustad mentioned is that there was a journey. There was a journey of learning. There was a learning curve where the religious aspects, they eventually they found that. But it, it wasn't at the sake of um, uh, of the cultural element, and that's that's uh, the more and more Muslims in uh, Muslim community in here become more aware of that. Then perhaps a lot of the bickering, the strife, the sectarianism, a lot of the religious problems within um, the community can move on by by recognizing the origins of um, of Islam within these lands. Wallahu Amen. Um before we ask uh, Sheikh Harun to do the concluding du'a, um, I mentioned this hadith by way of actually a du'a for the late great Sheikh Abdullah Kulim that um, we have a beautiful narration from the Yemeni companion Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu that he said that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam uh, said, uh, indeed when Allah, blessed and exalted be he, loves a person, mm -hmm. he calls Jibreel alayhi salam saying, indeed Allah has loved so and so, O Jibreel, so love him. So Jibreel Islam would love him and then he would make an announcement in the heavens and he would say, indeed Allah has loved so and so, therefore you love him. So all the dwellers of the heavens would love him and then he is granted al-qabul, he's granted acceptance fi ahl al-ard, in the people of the lands. Mm -hmm. And that's what we pray for, for the, the late Sheikh Abdullah Kuliyam, that he's a person who is from the awliya of Allah, from mm -hmm. the friends of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala selected uh, uniquely uh, in this you know, blessed city of Liverpool to, to carry his deen, to carry the sunnah of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. And we pray, as you said, this re-emergence of the name of Sheikh Abdullah Kulim 
is something for a moment for us to reflect that is this the hadith and Allah knows best and it's a dua mm. is it uh, is it proof of the dua that, that, that his name has this acceptance and you know Ustad Yahya correct me if I'm wrong one is in a Muslim circle but even I think amongst his peers uh, the non-Muslims uh, there was an acceptance of uh, the late Sheikh Abdullah Kuliam I, uh, Before you say anything <laughs> Blessed city of Liverpool, you said it. I said it. No, 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 I have to. Fadda. I have to. It's, it's the <laughs> cradle of Islam. In the <laughs> That's well, what I've got, been saying for so long. You're waiting. You're <laughs> waiting. Well, you know, I like to think that uh, Sheikh Ibrahim Osif is an, an Sheikh also has been another point of blessed revival for Shana the city of Liverpool. Hope so we pray well, like because the first rahlas were organised in the 90s from this blessed city, and most people don't know that or they overlook it. But um, that should also be yeah, seen I as from the that should one. that be seen as a second revival uh, of Islam from Liverpool, oh. which which helped I mean, the, help the whole whole nation, you know, inshallah. Jazakallah khairan, Sheikh Harun. If I could ask you to do the concluding du'a. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, Allahumma salli wa sallim ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi jama'in. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasanatun wa fi al-akhirati hasanatun wa qina azab al-nar. Rabbana taqabbal minna innaka anta al-sameel alim wa tub alayna ya maulana innaka anta al-tawwab al-rahim. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi jama'in. Subhana rabbika rabbil azzati amma yasifun wa salamun ala al-mursalim. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. I mean, exactly. Thank you so much to Sheikh Harun and to Ustad uh, Yahya Bert. Inshallah, we hope in a future podcast to speak about. Why am I Sheikh and he's Ustad? You've wronged, the you've wronged our guest. The shiuch, the shiuch. <laughs> Bismillah, fish. Uh, uh, Ast- Astag for Allah. And, from you being Sheikh or no, from you being Ustad? No, from me and, being Sheikh. I know Sheikh Yahya has alluded to it that we need to have a separate podcast. Well, one we hope to do, Inshallah, may Allah give us tawfiq, is specifically about the, the poetry of the uh, Sheikh Abdullah Kulim. Inshallah, Inshallah, may Allah give us tawfiq. Jazakallah khairan. Thank you so much for everybody who watch and uh, continue to remember us in your du'as. Inshallah. Jazakallah khairan. Assalamu alaikum. You're listening to Sunnah Stream, a podcast exploring the prophetic way.